Louis Takeda is the Oscar-nominated costume designer of Nightmare Alley. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Louis, uh, first and foremost, congratulations on the Oscar nomination. Um, how did you hear about the news? And uh, how does this one feel different from your first, which was for uh, The Shape of Water? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I think, well, I was, I was watching this time. Last time I didn't watch. Uh, last time I decided to just kind of see what would happen. Uh, but uh, I was watching this time and uh, texting with uh, one of my best friends and uh, and I found out like everyone else did uh, and I was super uh, excited and happy and honored. Yeah, um, I mentioned Shape of Water uh, a second ago and I wanted to ask you about working with um, Guillermo del Toro again. Um, you know, just how did he pitch you the idea of doing Nightmare Alley and kind of walking into this universe, which is so um, specific? And also, what is it like working with a director that has uh, what seems to the audience such an impeccable attention to detail? Um, well, when, when Guillermo approached me about doing uh, the film, I was uh, in Australia doing uh, uh, another picture and um, it was kind of like, this is gonna happen quite, quite soon. So I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, in our first uh, meeting, he talked about the two worlds. He talked about the color palette. He talked about um, how uh, we were not to look at really the old movie or uh, I'd seen it. He said, good, and don't look at it again. And, uh, and uh, he wanted to have his own take on the story as Guillermo does. And um, we really talked about uh, the the look and feel of each of these uh worlds um in 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 sense of the the textures and and the, the treatments of the fabrics and the style notes um and one being harking backwards and one looking very much forward yeah and i wanted to really dive into that more specifically because um like as you said uh it's a period piece you're grappling with two very different worlds the first third or so of the film is set in a carnival setting with hundreds of background actors um, and it's set in the 30s and 40s and then we kind of move into the upper echelons of metropolitan society so i'm just wondering if you didn't look back at the source material um you know what kind of resources did you have to really kind of make sure that you were you know period authentic but also bring your own you know kind of creative style to the, to the piece well i obviously had a lot of research uh already because i'm a collector and and a little bit of a nut for it um and i had uh, an amazing book that i bought in the late 80s that was like 1939 menswear um three volume set everything that you could ever want to know about menswear for 1939 so that was that kind of took care of of the of the city for for menswear and, and as for the carnival it really was looking at at portrait um, photography and um, uh, photojournalism and uh, people's actual old photos and put together a five volume set of, of images for the film. Uh, so as well in my collection, I had catalogs with fabrics in them. So we were able to, to really understand what the fabric was of the day. And then it, I took that to task and, and just went out and, and looked for those fabrics uh, in Rome and Madrid, New York, Toronto, um, and tried to find uh, if they were not original fabrics from that time as close to that as, as possible with that kind of dry hand and the coarse wools. And, and it really was about uh, bringing the flavor of, of that world, uh, both worlds um, to screen. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you too about the scale of that. Um, like I mentioned, there's hundreds of background actors in those carnival scenes in particular. You know, how are you working with uh, your hair and makeup designers and the production designers to kind of bring that kind of period authenticity, not just to your, you know, featured players, but to uh, large swaths of, of background performers? So every, every um, extra was pre-fit in this movie. And so, um, we would also include hair and makeup was part of that. And so uh, it was always this kind of uh, go between the two, three departments um, to find those characters. And I think the, the extras really have characters to them. And I had two wonderful uh, extras uh, uh, people. Um, one was the supervisor and one was the, was the um, coordinator. And they were 
instrumental and obviously fitting each and every one of the, those uh, extras. Um, I would go in and, and jump in when I could, but I had I had uh, my cast to to deal with. Um, and again, I would check everything on the day and we'd make some last minute uh, changes and uh, uh, I would speak to each and every extra like basically in a big form about you know how important they were to the to the film. Uh, I asked them to, you know, watch out for what color they were wearing and not saddle up to someone else in the same color and help us paint um, the frame. And um, and so that, that I think also helped in essence that they felt engaged, um, at least from from our standpoint in the picture. Yeah, I spoke with um, Cleona Fury and Joanne McNeil, who did the hair and makeup design. Um, and one of the costumes that they talked a lot about in that conversation was uh, Tony Collette's costume, which you know was kind of backdated because she's kind of a faded um, star. So that you know your costume design was a little bit earlier period. So I just wanted to ask you about you know some of those kind of performer costumes um, for the featured uh, actors in those sequences, uh, where you could have some fun and really kind of work on you know, uh, something that's more performative. So her costumes or when Rooney Mara is playing um, in the electric chair. Um, so just talk yes. about putting those, putting those uh, pieces together. For sure. Well, well, we didn't get to see it in the film, but almost all of those main characters have quick changes. They have some sort of performance outfit that enabled the quick change. Uh, Rooney, uh, Rooney's did, did actually did not, but, but with Tony, she did. And so, we got to see this, you know, un, unfurling of this and seeing the the plain clothing underneath. Um, and for that, it really was about showing the age of the garment. We had finished that garment days before, and then we took it to task to, to really age it out so that it felt it had lived uh, a long life of being thrown into a trunk and then brought back out. Um, and again, with the velvet cloak, we had uh, aged that as well and airbrushed and sanded and uh, the gold bouillon embroidery was actually done in India. We sent the fabric in, in pieces uh, to have it embroidered and the first time we did it we lost it. Uh, never, it never it never came out of customs. It's to this day it's still an Indian customs so we had to recut a second one and send it through and you know talk about pressure because it was literally a few days before we needed it um, that we actually received the uh, pieces in order to put it together. Um, wow. And and then the headscarf was built out of a really beautiful old shawl that I cut up and, and we made into, uh, again, a quick change, you know, kind of uh, a helmet uh, headscarf that she could just throw on and take off. And that was really kind of, everyone had this facade to them. So, um, uh, that that was part of the part of the charm of creating not only their their carnival clothes but also these um, these stage clothes that that um, would would have various mechanisms and, and ways to get on and off. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we followed two characters from the carnival scenes uh, into the kind of metropolitan scenes: uh, Bradley Cooper's Stanton and Rooney Mara's um, Molly. I just wanted to ask you, and I know, I know this applies to every costume you do on every film, but in those, uh, with those two characters in particular, it really feels like you have to tell a lot of the story about their transformation through their looks and kind of fill in a lot of the gaps in what maybe the audience does not see. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what was that process like for you in kind of picking what we first see them in after we move out of the carnival and kind of looking inside their characters um, on what they're wearing? Well, you know, of course, like when we, when we leave them, uh, when they leave the carnival and we, we see that they, the last image of, of them is post fight and it's, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a troubling and, and, you know, there's, there's hope, but there's also a lot of, a lot of pain. Um, and so I think what you see then is the next image is literally black tie. And it was about the glamour of that. And, um, the cut of all the clothes for the for the carnival for Stan was you know a little bit um, not fitted, falling off a little a little off the body. In, in essence, trying to hide the physique that we would later um, see um, as as his power grew. Um, so that really was about that trans and complete 
transition from one to the other. Um, what's interesting about Molly is that we retained some of those pieces from the carnival and she kept them throughout where, where Stan, uh, you know, I've been saying would have burnt all his clothing uh, at, at the uh, first opportunity. Um, so really that was, that was what, uh, what uh, I wanted to create this, this bridge and even style wise, that's what we did with the carnival. There's only two years difference, but with the carnival, because we were looking back, we're really looking like 1933, 1935. And then when we hit the city, we really are 1941. And so it really helped to, to create these two uh, worlds with very little time in between. Yeah, and speaking of glamorous, um, we meet uh, Kate Blanchett's character, Dr. Lil Lilith Ritter, uh, once we move into the city. Um, and Kate is in such kind of sleek and sophisticated and elegant and kind of cool colors. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, you know, really your ideas on how to shape that look. Uh, when I talked to uh, Cleona and jo uh, jo uh, Joanne, they talked about using Lauren Bacall as a model. So I was just wondering, you know, what kind of inspiration did you draw for, for Kate's look, um, which is such a kind of pivotal um, character for, for the second half of the film? Well, I mean, for, for, the, for the character itself, um, we had to legitimize her. We had to make sure that she was believable as this doctor. And so the, the, the suitings and, and the tailoring was, was key. Um, there, there wasn't really anything that was frivolous. There was no um, detail that was going to be misread. Everything was very, very serious and, and sober. Also, she came, came from old money. And so um, that impeccable tailoring um, on point fashion was, was for me really important. Uh, in regards to some of the fabric choices, the, the pebble suit, the black pebble suit, even though it was black, had a sheen to it that, that gave back um, in very low light and with the accessories that popped. And, and again, um, her, her silk blouse just kind of sung in that, in, in that scene. Um, and so it really was about um, creating a noir-esque feeling in a non-noir, you know, we're dealing with color, so it's not, it's not noir, but um, I really tried to, to bring the, sh the flat and shiny aspects to, to her costuming. Yeah, and it just feels so of a piece with the kind of production design and world of her office and, and everything that we see. It's it's so seamless and, and beautiful. Um, speaking of uh, other costumes that really kind of tell the story, as we were talking about earlier, um, the kind of climax of the film hinges on putting uh, Molly Rooney Mara's character into this um, costume and hairstyle from um, of somebody from Ezra Grindle's past. So I wanted to talk to you about you know the look of that particular scene in particular, um, just getting the costume right, probably or perhaps going even further back in time to kind of get a, a, you know, a look from maybe the 1800s uh, when this character would have lived. Just talk about putting that, that piece together, which is so vital to the plot and the climax of the film. Yeah, I mean, so here, here's what we, what we wanted from that costume was evoking obviously the time period, but there needed to be a feeling that it was a costume. So it was not exactly from that time period. It was a interpretation uh, done in done in um, the late thirties, probably because it was done done not made immediately at that time. And so um, with Guillermo, he wanted that the Edwardian, almost Victorian, but really Edwardian look, um, and a pure white, and that was pretty close to pure white. We did, we tinted it slightly purple um, because it worked with the lighting. Uh, and then I played, you know, I played uh, with the stripes and created a basket weave center, center um, uh, section and uh, tried to give it a little uh, design, uh, you know, fun. Uh, and underneath there, because it was so, so cold, we of course, you know, had all kinds of thermals and warm up boots and all that. But uh, yeah, the, the essence of it was, was simply that it was supposed to be a costume. So um, complete accuracy was not um, exactly required as opposed to, you know, for instance, Stan suits were all uh, taken from really uh, never worn dead stock 1939 suits. And we were able to take the blocks from those and recreate 
um, suits that were literally how they would have fit um, in the day with slight modifications, obviously for modern, a modern body. Um, but that's with the dress, it was, it was kind of a play on, on a period. Okay, I have one more question about a specific um, costume in particular, and then um, I have something else for you. But uh, the final scene of the film is so evocative um, and so memorable. And we have that really close up shot uh, on Bradley Cooper to end the film. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, I won't go into any further spoilers, but go watch it, it's streaming now. Um, but I just wanted to, to get your sense of, again, we're, we're jumping ahead in time in those kind of final scenes. So, you know, what was the kind of goal of the look and how, you know, how did you go about, again, working with hair and makeup to really get that final frame uh, just right? So, I mean, without spoiling it, we had to create a, a history um, in that costume um, because it was something that uh, was obviously worn repeatedly. And again, I, I was uh, uh, fortunate to have incredible uh, agers and dyers textile artists that were able to to help tell that story um and with Guillermo we we went in stages we I would show him and I'm like I think it needs a little more and he's like yes and I would I would show Bradley and yes it needs a little more and and then we had a, a fitting with that costume um to really assess kind of a dress rehearsal whether it was all working and we made some tweaks on that um, but really it's it's looking again at the cut which was different from from his earlier time and uh you know we we talked about did he lose his boots did he change his shirt did he you know so it really is creating um this undercurrent and that, and that's what you know us costume designers do we're the only people that really think that much about a, a costume um you, you know we live and breathe it and sleep it so um for me it really was about helping to tell that story uh in a believable way yeah, okay, and just two uh, final questions for you. One, I would just lo love to know what is your favorite kind of sing single look from the film uh, that you worked on? And then second, just kind of bookend, you know, where we started, uh, what does the Oscar nomination, you know, mean for you for, for the work on this film and, and at this point in your career? So to answer your first question, um, I think the, the outfit that I love the most is one that we hardly see, which is what I call the Kate shadow dress. Uh, the, the black suit is incredible, incredibly uh, tailored and beautiful, and I'm thankful that it got so much airtime. But the, the shadow dress was, was a beautiful velvet dress uh, with uh, gold glion um, uh, throughout, and uh, it really was, was a stunner. And I've said, I've said this before, but when Kate came out of the fitting room, uh, dressing room that day, and we were walking onto set, she looked to me and said, you know, Mr. Cicada, this is a, a damn fine frock. And so I knew that, that I'd hit, hit the mark with, with her, which was amazing. Um, unfortunately, it became part of the movie where we just introduced her and, and we didn't see um, a, a ton of it, but it, it remains one of my favorite pieces. Um, and also the, all, the, all the pieces that worked with it, the, the jewelry, the purse, the, the cape, um, it was all really quite exquisite. Um, and what does it mean to be nominated? Gosh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor. It's, a, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm floored. Uh, I'm still walking a little bit in a, a twilight zone. Uh, but I'm, you know, what, what's amazing is that obviously we are, uh, the nominees are picked by, by our fellow peers. And so I'm thankful that the work um, was appreciated and 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 uh, understood, and because uh, there were lots of wonderful, amazing films, it was a banner year for uh, costume. Um, so I'm uh, quite thankful. Uh, agreed, yours included, um, Louis Cicada. Congratulations again on the Oscar nomination, and thanks so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thanks so much, David.